Morning classes at the LaRue School in northern Uganda look like those at many American schools. Behind. Behind. The children are learning vocabulary. And the eager ones think they know all the answers. But walk around the grounds of LaRue and you notice this school is different. Barbed wire surrounds the campus, which itself is set down a dusty country road, isolated from nearby towns. And students are studying a subject you don't normally see in middle school classrooms, anger management. What is anger? Uh -huh. What is anger? Anger is a strong feeling of this place here. The LaRue School is officially called the School for War Affected Children. And all 700 pupils who live and study here have in some way been brutally touched by a war that has raged around their community for 20 years. A war many Americans have never heard about. A war that has specifically targeted children, turning them into both victims and killers. What I can remember is killing. Putting people in a hut and burning them to death. I myself killed 30 people. At the age of eight, Sarah was abducted from her bed at midnight by rebel fighters. She was handed a gun and made to join their fight. She was also raped by her captors and at age 14 gave birth to a rebel's child. The thoughts remain in my mind and at night I dream of what I have seen. I don't feel like a normal person. Sarah's classmates listen quietly to her story. And then Pasca tells us something almost unbearable to hear that she too was made to kill in unimaginable ways. We used big sticks and afterwards we were forced to eat their blood and their brains. And if we refused, we ourselves were killed. Later we meet little Felix, whose eyes and thoughts seem distant. When he was just 10, Felix was made to beat a nine-year-old friend to death because the boy could not bear the weight of the bags the rebels had forced him to carry. When I'm alone and thinking, the demons come. The rebels want to show them that they are part of them, and they want them to be strong. They say they have to be bold. So they give them somebody to, to, to kill among them. Child counselor Florence Lachore explains that making children kill each other is a kind of initiation rite. They have to trample them on feet, or sometimes they have to box them until they're dead. Sometimes they have to bite them with their teeth. And you have to bite so hard that you come out with blood on your teeth. And sometimes they tie them and just hit their head with sticks. They said that would make them strong. These children are the lucky ones. They managed to escape the brutal life they were forced into. But there is literally an army of children still out there, exploited and abused by this man, a warlord named Joseph Kony. Kony is a self-styled prophet of the African jungle who has assembled a renegade militia known as the Lord's Resistance Army. The LRA once fought against Uganda's military on behalf of tribes who felt oppressed by the ruling government. But political goals quickly degenerated into mass brutality, and the LRA is now simply a predatory menace, bent on its own survival, preying on the very population it once claimed to defend. This is Africa's forgotten war, and while Uganda's own army has been accused of abuses, it is the LRA, a gang of thugs with guns, that even in a region of extreme brutality is unparalleled in its madness. Over 25,000 children abducted and made into soldiers, girls raped and made rebel brides, and the cutting of ears, noses, and lips to keep an already frightened population paralyzed. Kony styles himself a mystic, saying he wants to rule Uganda by the Ten Commandments. He holds sway over his followers through biblical verse and trance-like rituals. This is a man who believes he's a god. He's had a lot of power over the years. He decides whether you die or leave. He decides whether your lips should, and tongue and uh, uh, nose and ears should be cut off. Betty Bagombe is one of the few outsiders to have met the elusive Joseph Kony. In 1994, as a young minister in the national Ugandan government, she journeyed to Kony's jungle hideaway for face-to-face -face negotiations. There were children with machete around me, and then all these performance, singing hymns, some of them falling down like demon was coming. I mean, the scene is so mesmerizing. You don't know what's going on. And then when he's coming, you see him, it was a hill, and it was like, 
just cloud of dust and in no minutes they're with you and at that moment it's like everybody is possessed. He's messianic. He believes that he is a Moses-like figure for northern Uganda. He's going to lead the people of northern Uganda who have been discriminated against and, and treated badly by the government in the south. He's going to lead them to the promised land. Remember Moses had to kill on his, in his mission so of course it's justifiable. <laughs> Messianic messages have the potential to resonate deeply among this devoutly Christian community. This is a place where tribal traditions mix comfortably with ecclesiastical faith. And as much as this war has been fought in the name of scripture, so too has the word of God comforted this war-torn populace. Tribals and fighting uh, uh, reach the outskirts of the, of the parish and we are hearing of abductions very close to us. And so people were resorting, were coming here to find the refuge. Uganda has historically been a nation in great need of comfort. This is, after all, the country once ruled by the infamous Idi Amin, who killed hundreds of thousands of his own citizens in a brutal reign of terror, reportedly feeding many corpses to crocodiles and keeping severed heads in his refrigerator. Amin once lived here on the second floor of the luxurious Nile Hotel while his victims were being tortured in rooms nearby. But these days, the Nile Hotel sparkles under a fresh coat of paint and a new name, ready to host a headline meeting of global leaders this November. In fact, much of Uganda's capital, Kampala, has grown into the very image of a modern African city. Construction is booming, and the streets are filled with office workers moving a quickly growing economy. Uganda has successfully dropped its rate of HIV-AIDS. And the United States considers President Yawiri Museveni one of its strongest allies in Africa. But drive just four hours north of Kampala and you cross the Nile River. You also cross into a different kind of country, one untouched by the Uganda success story. A place where years of torment by the LRA have bred poverty and illness. A place where 90% of the population has fled to densely packed displacement camps for fear of their lives. 1,000 people die every week as a result, an indirect result of the violence that has driven them into the camps where disease is prevalent, where malnutrition is extensive, and where people just slowly erode in their capacity to survive. In Uganda, it's just been a slow, steady erosion. Most of these people, have, I think you can see, they are floating. Nowhere to go. Just floating, yeah. yeah floating. That's an interesting word, floating. <laughs> John Prendergast is a longtime Africa watcher and senior analyst at the International Crisis Group, an influential organization dedicated to ending so conflicts. He first started coming here in the 1980s. Hi, why are they here? What, what caused them to come to this camp here? Uh, they are fearing Libya? death. Okay. You know, these rebels, they, when they get you, they get they, they killed. Yeah. So, you know, being a human being, you should fear uh, death. Yes. That's why they are here in the camp. The camps are packed. Upwards of 20,000 people housed together on a few acres, the huts just feet apart. Clean water is scarce, and sanitation is abysmal. Rudimentary latrines are a breeding ground for disease. Jobs in these remote camps are hard to find, so many adults turn to alcohol to pass the time. These residents started at 9 a.m. The suicide rate is alarmingly high, especially among young mothers who feel they cannot properly care for their families. Most of these children have been born in the camps, never knowing life outside this cramped existence. For them, there is often no school. Their only distraction comes from wooden cars with soda bottle caps for wheels and when one of the many humanitarian aid trucks rolls through bringing supplies. In the camp, so many things have happened. The cultural values have been destroyed. And uh, you find that the upbringing of the children is completely difficult. That means the future of these children, unless God shows us mercy, we, we can be very doubtful about the future of these children. Yet the residents here would rather continue to suffer as they do then face the dangers that have awaited them just footsteps outside these camps. My home is just a half kilometer from here. What I saw physically, rebels came at my place. What they did, they cut the leaves of someone when I was seeing. That's why I ran from there. Secondly, my, my, my children were abducted 
And up to now, they have not yet come back. I don't know. Might be they are killed. The fear of abduction has been so high among the children here that this war has created a phenomenon unseen anywhere else in the world. The night commuters, children who walk miles each night from their own homes and refugee camps to protected shelters where they can sleep together in safety. The LRA starts targeting children from the age of eight when they are big enough to carry a gun, yet still young enough to be brainwashed. I'm not, I'm not happy when I sleep at home because any time I can think the rebel can come at night. I have to need to take care of myself. 14-year-old Michael, whose father was killed by rebels, chooses a corner to sleep in. He says because it is less noisy. Still, he's tired. I need to start sleeping at home because I'm tired of walking every day. It takes a lot of time. It takes an hour to come. And then one hour to go back. Yeah. So two hours every day. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of your time, isn't it? Mm. It takes a lot. This has become a society upended by brutality. Kids huddling together to survive the night, a generation wounded much more deeply than any physical scar can reveal. Margaret was pregnant with her youngest child when the rebels came. They killed four of us and one child. They would not kill me, they said, because then their own wives would be cursed and unable to give birth. So instead, they cut my mouth, ears, and eyes. They may not have killed her, but they ruined Margaret's life nonetheless. She has been branded a victim, and so she cannot forget. When I am with others and I am busy, I don't think about it. But when I am alone, I still feel very angry about what has happened to me. Margaret is one of an entire generation that has been torn apart by a 20-year war, a conflict that until last year seem to have no hope of ending. After 20 years of war and brutality, northern Ugandans had little hope left. But surprisingly, a fragile calm has arrived here, because for the first time in years, the LRA has begun to talk peace. Representatives of warlord Joseph Kony sat down with counterparts from the Ugandan government and signed a ceasefire agreement. But the war is far from over. The Children of War Rehabilitation Center has been preparing for months for the hundreds of abducted children that were supposed to have been released by Kony as part of that agreement. But the children have never arrived. The bunk rooms sit empty, and only one little boy, an orphan whose parents were both LRA captives killed in battle, receives the care of the waiting staff. We have the people who are standing by. We have a task force in all the departments waiting. Every morning we come back, we go home, no children. Surprisingly, a final peace agreement has been held up in part by events in a courtroom 4,000 miles away, where a tribunal wants to try Joseph Kony and his three top henchmen for their atrocities. It is the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Established in 2002, it is a culmination of the ideals that the world's worst crimes should never again go unpunished. If you look around the world today, in terms of conflicts and where there's victimization, northern Uganda, very sadly, qualifies as one of the worst conflicts on the planet. Christine Chung is a senior trial lawyer at the ICC. She drew up the charges against Kony and his men. There are 33 counts of crimes against humanity and war crimes that have been leveled against Kony and three of his top commanders. And the counts include charges of murder, enslavement, sexual enslavement, inducing of rape, conscripting of children, attacks against civilian populations, pillaging. The case of the LRA seemed to many to be a slam dunk, a clear-cut villain and a victimized population. But the reality is far more complicated. When the ICC issued its indictments, uh, Northern Ugandan almost uniformly was supportive of this idea because they thought that an army would follow the issuance of these arrest warrants some army from somewhere around the world, the UN, the United States, whoever it is, would come in and grab these guys, these suspects, and take them to The Hague. Well, nothing's further from the truth. For all its international support and expert lawyers, the ICC does not have its own police force. 
It is reliant on the armies of its sponsoring countries, including Uganda's own UPDF, to arrest and deliver its most wanted to its prisons in The Hague. UPDF has been trying for the last 20 years or so to kill or arrest them. What magic wand are you giving UPDF by giving them a piece of paper and agreement that they can now do it when they have not been able to do it in, uh, in so many years? And no knights in shining armor were riding in from Europe or the United States either. The very countries that were making extraordinary speeches about the end of impunity the day that those indictments were issued, mostly from Europe, not, never lifted a pinky to try to create a strategy for apprehending these suspects and doing the necessary dirty work, rolling up their sleeves, investing in some of the military and police uh, aspects of the strategy to be able to capture these guys. So of course they're running scot-free. And of course, rather rapidly, people lost confidence in the ICC and its ability to change the dynamic in northern Uganda. Confidence lost, perhaps, but not entirely gone. For by many accounts, it was the ICC warrants that first forced the LRA to the negotiating table. Kony himself is concerned enough to hire lawyers to defend him if necessary. The peace talks are clearly on everyone's minds. On the airwaves and in the headlines, northern Uganda is at a crossroads. Though most residents are still too frightened to leave the safety of their displacement camps, many are journeying back outside to resume at least parts of daily life. On this first day of school, hundreds of children are again registering for classes, and the streets of nearby towns are bustling with business. They've had a bit of a moment here, a respite, uh, where they, they don't have to fear abductions, where they can start to venture outside the camps and begin to cultivate. All that is at grave risk. It only takes a few hundred people to literally keep this place on fire. Indeed, this peace may be fleeting, and those negotiations, at first so promising, have recently ground to a halt and are at risk of collapse. Although there are several political reasons for the lack of progress at the talks, Kony has turned the tables on the ICC warrants, making them a major sticking point for his surrender. He has made his position clear. I won't stop fighting for good, he says, until these warrants are dropped. But the ICC is holding its ground. It can't drop the indictments now, it says. The warrants can't be revoked. All of a sudden, it appears to many Ugandans that what had at first been the promise of an end to atrocities has now itself become an obstacle to a permanent peace agreement. We witnessed this firsthand as we visited one of the largest displacement camps in northern Uganda with Betty Bagombe and John Prendergast. In a public forum, anger towards the ICC and even the United States boiled over. We, the women, the mothers, are suffering the most as the children are dying every day because of the conditions in the camps. I feel like committing suicide because if the peace talks fail, we are all going to die. America is the superpower. Why don't you come? Why don't you come here and take care of these people? Our problem is the ICC. They should drop the arrest warrants because that's the main obstacle of the peace talks. Take our message. We have suffered for 20 years and a number of people have died. If you care about our lives, let the ICC warrants be dropped. The ICC is a good court. It should be supported. But it's not necessary in this case. I think their time has run out. They have let us down also. Norbert Mao is a district chairman in northern Uganda. He leads a delegation of local representatives who have met regularly with the LRA over the last year, trying to press for their own negotiated peace. Mao sees some sign of humanity within Joseph Kony and thinks a deal can be made with this devil. It's not for me to reconcile the atrocities he has committed with his human side, but rather it's for me to present a complex personality to the world. And right now, for purposes of peace in northern Uganda, we should concentrate on attracting whatever is human inside him to come to the surface. Even though Norbert Mao is a lawyer, he is not looking to the courtroom to solve the problems of northern Uganda. 
and he does not want to see Kony head to the ICC. Most people are obsessed with punishment. If you kill, you should also either be killed or jailed. If you abduct children, you should be punished. But the scale of atrocities for which the LRA is responsible just makes it necessary for us to think beyond punishment. It's not enough to lock up Joseph Coyne in a jail. What we need is to build something which can restore the social harmony. Social harmony, says Mao, best achieved through traditional tribal justice. He suggests a deal in which Joseph Kony and his leadership come back to the very communities they have long terrorized, to face their victims, admit their crimes, pay compensation, and then rejoin society. It is an Acholi tribal ritual called Mato Oput, named after the bitter root drunk as part of the ceremony. It has been working, for in the case of Mato Oput, has been working since Acholi has been in existence in this planet. Anglican Bishop Nelson Anono has also been negotiating directly with the LRA. African solution, the world doesn't understand it. I wish the lawyers would go to start studying the tradition, the system in the tradition we have in the world. Some are better solution to our global problems. If there is any evidence of these Ugandans' remarkable ability to forgive or at least move on, it is this scene, the funeral of a woman named Alice Laquena. Although Joseph Kony is the infamous leader of the LRA, it was actually his aunt, Laquena, who first took up arms against the Ugandan government and through her own blend of religion and mysticism, created what later became the LRA. Laquena herself was responsible for crimes often as brutal. Yet perhaps startling to Western eyes, 500 people came out to bury her. A sign, says Bishop Anono, of the people's capacity to forgive even the worst sins. That gives me great hope. That makes me celebrate in my heart. It will represent the level of forgiveness the people here have. Very, very high level. And you wouldn't believe 500 would turn up for the funeral of a rebel leader who caused many children to be killed. Very high level of forgiveness. And I thank God for that, that people mean what they say. But for Mato Opa to work, Joseph Kony would have to admit his guilt, something he has refused to do, even as recently as during this rare public statement last summer. Those atrocities which was happened in Uganda, that is not me or that is not my people. Atrocity which was taking place in Uganda was done by Uganda government. I did not accept anybody which was in the booth. And there's no any children in my position or in my camp. Still, the people's desperation for an end to war continues to make them turn to Mato Oput as a last hope for peace, even if it means overlooking potential limitations within the process. There's a lot of romanticization about Mato Oput because Mato Oput has never been tested to handle uh, the cases of death to this magnitude. You know, in the past, one person has been killed, the two clans get together, the rituals are performed, simple and straight. Now, you're having an issue here where thousands of people have lost their lives. So it's much more complex to deal with it. Secondly, Matuput does not deal with, it deals only with murder, rape, abduction, uh, all these other crimes are not taken care of by Matuput. Traditional justice is a complete answer for thousands of returnees from the LRA in the view of the ICC. The only people who've ever been in the LRA with whom, with respect to whom traditional justice may not be enough are the four people who are named in the warrants, the very, very top leadership of the LRA. Indeed, when you speak to some victims away from the bluster of a public gathering, you hear from them also that the idea of punishment is not just a Western ideal. I support that these people should be tried. So if Joseph Kony were to be given Mato Oput and able to return to the community, would you be angry about that? I am already feeling angry, not only for Kony, but the others who are already returning, which the government is supporting so strongly, while people like me who are hurt are not even looked at or supported. I am really angry because it is unfair. 
And back at the LaRue School, some formerly abducted children say they also need to see punitive justice done. First, Mato Put can be done. But then after that, they should still be put in prison. If they come here, they should be executed by government troops. My life was spoiled a long time ago. It has all already happened. So for me, there is no difference whether they are in prison or forgiven. If what we've done in the end is to call attention to a 20-year war, to the atrocities that were committed as part of that war, if, we've done, if what we've done is collect testimonies from victims of that war and called that to the attention of the world community, I would not say that that is a bad record. I think the ICC, I'm, I think it was the right case to start with. It's, it's, a, it's a slam dunk case in terms of the legal uh, uh, evidence for the crimes against humanity that have been committed. It's just a hard political terrain and they're going to have to navigate it. A navigation made more difficult, says Prendergast, by the absence of the United States, which is not a signatory to the ICC, but nevertheless may still have a diplomatic role to play. This conflict is resolvable. It's the easiest conflict in Africa to resolve. We have lost so much moral capital in the last few years as a result of Iraq and other international uh, developments. To regain that uh, is going to be an urgent priority. I can't think of a better waste of a couple of hundred thousand dollars, which is all we're really talking about, to get a couple of diplomats in play and to do the work of getting a peace deal done in northern Uganda. But for now, with the negotiations still stalled, there is no clear future for peace in northern Uganda. Here on the outskirts of a displacement camp, women dance to traditional song. But the words they sing are timely. They sing of what they hope their future holds, back at home in their villages. These women were trying to reflect back at the time when they were at home, there was peace, there was joy, they could dance in the villages, in the homes. The song is actually trying to tell us that, yes, let peace come, we long to go back home. The tradition that we used to have and the culture will come back again. Betty Bagombe has made it one of her missions to save the children caught up in the violence in northern Uganda. She first came face to face with child soldiers when she went to rebel leader Joseph Kony's jungle camp in 1994. In one moment, the, the, this really horrible people who are uh, children who want to kill, that's all they know. In a ne another moment, that mask drops and you can see a child and an infant and they start calling you mommy, and they want to hold your hand, and they want to just touch you. Though Kony's camp was intimidating, Begombe was able to win over some of his young fighters. Her heart has happened to steal all our heart to follow her, and we are having hope that we are going to come home because of this lady. And everyone was like, wanted to know who she is, and her name was all over in the bush. Everyone like, Mama Betty be gone, my Mama Betty be gone, my Mama Betty be gone, my. everyone. Patrick may now look like a typical 24-year-old, but at that time, he was one of Coney's trusted bodyguards, his life truly subject to the laws of the jungle. You move like an animal, whereby it doesn't have where to stay permanently, you know? And you don't have your father, you don't have your relative, you don't have anybody close to you. At any moment, at any time you met, you happen to make any mistake, the only solution is to kill you or you should die. Like many other children abducted by the LRA, Patrick was taken from his classroom at school. His indoctrination started immediately. The only way that LRA can brainwash people is to like at least make you know that the killing is the only thing that is going to happen in your life. Like saying that you are carrying maybe a bottle of soda and you made a mistake of dropping it and it happened to break, then you're dead. They'll beat you so badly because why have you done that? But Patrick did what he was told and not only survived, but was soon recognized as a capable fighter. He rose quickly in the ranks. 
For him to be doing what, what he did, you must have been brutal. You're somebody who executes orders in a very timely manner. He must have been one of those trusted ones, and you win trust through being brutal. Betty was not able to bring Patrick or any other child soldiers home in 1994. But over the years, many have been rescued, captured, or have even mounted daring escapes. This has left northern Uganda with the extremely difficult challenge of how to reintegrate highly traumatized children who have been both victim and perpetrator. You see my office always busy. Every time they are knocking, they are knocking. Madam, I would like to talk to you. Winifred Achayo is a child counselor at the LaRue School for War-Affected Children. When you have seen something like killing using an axe, in fact, it remained in you. And when you are being forced to kill somebody innocently, yet that person be crying with your name, leave me, leave me, I've not wronged to you. Why are you killing me? Don't kill me. So that thing also remained in them. One of the main ideas behind the school of 700 students, many of them former combatants, is to allow the children to heal through sharing the burden of suffering with each other. When they sit alone, they begin to imagine. They recall everything that happened when they are still in the bush. And that's why many times you find them dreaming in the night, the demons will come. So there's need for them to be in a group. When the rest are playing, they should also join them. The school also plays a role as a sort of middle ground where the children can slowly prepare for eventual re-entry to society. Betty Bagambe, who has a wing at the school named after her, says the adjustment is hard. On their own, apparently, they're gaining more confidence, but they're very lost when you take them out among other people. They're secure here. They feel secure. They're eating well. They talk about their experiences. Sometimes when they meet one another, where they've been together, the same, they laugh, talk about those days. But one wonders how they will eventually in their life, after having left here, how they will be able to adjust. Getting the children ready for a return to normal life is one matter. Getting society to accept them back is another, says World Vision counselor Florence Lachore. The people in the community look at them like people who have killed, people who have murdered. They look at them that people who can do it again. So there's that fear mixed with they don't know what they, these children, the, what their future holds. There was a parent who came and asked me, do you think she will not hurt other children at home? Do you think we can take her back in our family? I said, this is your child, what do you think? The difficulty of finding a place back in society has been so hard it has even driven some, shockingly, back into the ranks of the LRA. You know, quite a few have gone back. You come out, there's no means of livelihood. There's not even a meal a day. You're on the street, you're thinking of how, you know, will you live from one day to the next. In the bush, you don't go and maybe pay for anything. The only thing that you're going to pay for is like either losing your life by being killed by, the, by your enemy, or you will succeed getting something for free, you know? So they find it very easy for them to do that. In many ways, Patrick is a test case for the successful reintegration of former child soldiers. In his 10 years in the bush, Patrick rose to be a commander in the LRA. But one night, inspired by the words of Isaiah, when you make many prayers, I will not hear, for your hands are full of blood, he disobeyed orders from the top and led his entire unit out of the jungle. My living LRA, it was something like a miracle that a pen in my life. But Patrick came out to find a changed world. His father had been killed by the very rebels he had been forced to join. He is now alone, struggling to come to terms with his violent past. You know, the victim size, side doesn't bother me so much. Being a perpetrator, that is what is like, sometimes I feel like, why should I be even in this world? It's really very, 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 very challenging and painful for me. Far behind in his education, at the age of 24, Patrick is unable to rejoin high school. So he's studying on his own for his GED. You're going to set your exams in March. How, prepared, how well prepared are you? Yeah. You think you are ready by that time? Or? He has also started a friendship with the woman who came to his camp in 1994, Betty Bagombe. 
Betty helps him when she can, as she does with other former fighters she has met. You know, Patrick is really one of the better off. He can speak English. He's got a personality that can sell. The thousands who do not know what is going to happen to them. And to me, this is a huge uh, source of threat to the region. When the war ends, we're going to be faced with insecurity of the magnitude you do not know. These are children who are used to violence. These are children who have handled weapons. And we're not doing anything for them. But not all the news is bad. Many children who return from the LRA do manage to pick up their lives, more or less, where they left them. Lawrence, who is now 17, spent five years as a captive of the LRA. But although he is one of the oldest kids in his school, he has been welcomed back by his friends and family and is now thriving. I'm involved in so many activities, and the school has just elected me head boy of my class. And even the students at the School for War-Affected Children, despite the trauma they have faced, can smile and dance and sometimes forget what they've been through and what they've done. <laughs>